If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the book of Revelation. It's easy to find. It's the last one in the Bible. It's Revelation chapter 2. We will be there for a few minutes, and then we're going to hop over to Acts chapter 4, and the lesson will be yours. While you're turning there, I want to encourage you to come back this evening. We are starting a new series on the life of Peter. And the series is called Beyond Denial. Beyond Denial. You know, we each have... I believe, a series of moments leading up to our defining moment that decides, depending on how we act, depending on how we choose to be, that determines who we will be for the rest of our life. And a lot of people, when they think about Peter, he's a lot like Thomas. You know, all we think about is the denial. We think, you know, Thomas, he doubted Jesus. Peter, he denied Jesus, and really, that's a lot of times, that's, that's who, what we think about immediately. I want us to look beyond the denial. I want us to look beyond some of Peter's failures to see how he was truly blessed and how there is a defining moment in his life when he decides, I want to be a child of God. And so I, w- I want to encourage you to come back tonight for that as we begin exploring his life uh, beginning at Luke chapter 5. So as, as, we, as we begin this morning, I, I got to say, it's a great, great thing to be part of an active congregation. You know, I, I was thinking about what's in our bulletin, and I know Tom will probably talk about a few of these announcements, but I, just to kind of review, just today, we have a, a ladies' meeting uh, right after services as soon as worship is over, just for two minutes to talk about the ladies' day coming up in the fall. We have a graduation luncheon uh, ha- happening right after services. We have a leadership meeting, and then next week we have a, a men's breakfast uh, meeting happening at, at our house uh, it's not hard to, to find. It's right over here. Um, so men, don't give the excuse. You don't know where it is. Uh, but we're having that. We have a big postal drive where we're going to go and collect food from the post office. And it's just, we're, we're an active congregation. And, and that's a blessing. And, and as I think about some of the different things that we have going on, one of the things that I, I couldn't help but mention is our open house. We have an open house coming up in less than two weeks. And I I think about the idea of an open house is, while we do invite visitors every single worship hour, we invite them to come through our doors, this is a a special opportunity for us to to sit back and to to open these doors, to, to invite people in and let them know who we are. Have you made plans to attend? I want you to think about, just for a moment, The idea of our open house, and our open house is going to be kind of the theme this morning for our lesson with the title of of being bold for Christ. Have have you made it your mission to serve at our open house? Have you thought about where your talents lie? Because this is not just a a one-shot event where we're only going to focus on just one thing. There's a lot of different opportunities to serve coming up in the next few Saturdays. And, and I think about, you know, it is on a Saturday, and a lot of times people say, oh, Saturdays. That's, that's my one day to sleep in, preacher. Sometimes I don't get to sleep in. I have, I have uh, my kids are doing stuff. That's my one day I get to go shopping for groceries. Uh, that's, that's one time I get to spend with, with my family. I'm just busy throughout the week. Don't ask me to give up my Saturday, preacher. You know, I think about that and I understand. I, I had a really enjoyable Saturday yesterday and it was nice to sleep in. And, and, and it was just, you know, you think about, well, you think about priority. This lesson is not to shame or to embarrass anyone. Uh, we're not going to look out and see who's here today and who's not here in two Saturdays and make a list, okay? I, but, but I want us to think just for a few moments this morning. What is the primary mission of the Lord's church? What is the primary mission? And we talked about this uh, right after Eric and I moved here. One of the first classes we had on Sunday morning. And we talked about discipleship. Jesus' final words before He left this earth ought to be our first work. Go therefore and make disciples. Of, Of whom? All nations! Not, not, just, not just those who are abroad, but those who are close by. Later, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, He said, I want you to be my eyewitnesses. And I want you to start in Jerusalem. And then go to Judea and Samaria. And I want you to go to the utter ends of the earth. And He noticed Jesus' pattern. His directive. He said, I want you to start locally. 
And then I want you to spread out. There's nothing wrong, church, with giving money and supporting missionaries to go to the darkest corners of the earth, some of the most hostile regions, to boldly preach Christ to those who might persecute them. But that does not pardon us from making disciples right here in town. I want us to think about this opportunity on May 19th at 10 a.m. when the doors open. What are people going to see? Who are people going to see? Now, we might only have five citizens of Upland show up. We might have all 73,000 show up. We do not measure our success by how many attend. We measure our success on whether or not the Gospel was delivered to those who attend. So when I think about here we are in two weeks, 10 a.m., the doors open, when they arrive, when they visit, what will be our message to them? And it's not just what comes from our lips. It is by who we are. How we act. And I was thinking about perhaps the very first open house we read about in Scripture. And it's in Revelation chapter 2. You know, Revelation chapter 2, our open house is kind of voluntary. You know, we've planned it. We have banners. We have flyers. You know, we, we prep for it. This, this was almost like an exam rather than an open house. But this was an open house to so these seven congregations in Asia. Jesus examines who they are. He looks past the external and He sees the heart of each congregation and He lets them know exactly who He sees. Let's go over them very quick. So the first one in Revelation 2 is Ephesus. And you know what Jesus said to them? He said, you know what? I've seen who you are. I've seen your works, and yes, you are loyal to God. Yes, you are people who endure. Yes, you drive out false teaching. However, I have an issue. You have lost your first love. We don't know exactly what that means. Perhaps it means they weren't as mission-oriented as they used to be. Perhaps what they did, their actions, were not out of love, out of sincerity, but maybe it's just because, well, that's what we've always done. Maybe they had lost focus of, of community outside and within. We don't really know. All we know is that Jesus said, you're loveless. You have lost. You have abandoned your, your reason for being here. Be careful, lest you lose my light. Then he goes on to the next congregation. He goes on to Smyrna. Now, Smyrna was going through great difficulty. Verses 8 through 11. They're, they're facing persecution. We don't know exactly what type of persecution. We understand there's a lot of false teaching in this area. We understand that they were suffering for the name of Christ, but perhaps it was fear of the world and causing them to suffer that made them a little hesitant about going forward. And that's why Jesus wrote, or Jesus said in, in verse 9 and verse 10, He said, I, I don't want you to feel like you're poor. You are rich in every spiritual blessing. Now hold fast. Prepare yourselves. Persevere through the troubles, through the trials. I am the one who died and I came back to life. And I promise you the same if you persevere. Amen. Then the next congregation, Pergamum. Well, Pergamum was a good, good congregation. They're one that they held to the name of Jesus, as we read in verse 13. Uh, even though His own servant, His faithful witness, was slain right among them. But they had an issue too. They were compromising God's truth. They were allowing certain false teachings to infect them, to change their way of thinking they were allowing the worldliness to change them rather than changing the world. Jesus said, be careful. That's going to lead you to death. Then we move on to the church at Thyatira. Now this was a congregation, although, yes, they, they, they loved the Lord and they had faith and they had service and they had endurance. And I'm thinking, man, that's a great church. You got a church that loves, you got a church that has faith, you got a church that endures. Aren't those the ingredients we need for a successful congregation? Jesus said, hold on. There's an issue. You are tolerating 
certain individuals who are corrupting your members. You are allowing people who are not only living sinful lives, but also, like what we said, infect, they were infecting, they were corrupting other members, and they were committing all sorts of immoral sins. Jesus said, you can't allow that. You can't tolerate sin. We can be patient with people, but we got to oust the sin. Then he moves on to Sardis, perhaps one of the scariest symptoms of an unstable church. Jesus said, I know your reputation among men is great. Oh man, you got all these programs, you got all these classes. Look at what you're doing out here in the world. But I've seen past the external, the good building, the nice comfy pews. You're dead inside. You're you're asleep. You're, You're not awake. You're not paying attention. Then he moves on to Philadelphia, and this is the only congregation out of the seven where all he has to say are positive things. And he says, just, just listen. I'm going to open the door. No one's going to be able to shut it. Just, just hold on to your crown. Keep persevering. Keep moving forward. And then finally, Laodicea. They're not, they're not hot. They're not cold. They're lukewarm. And and the way he uses this imagery is that they had certain hot springs. And and, and a lot of people held that they could could have some magic healing, that that you could really heal your body and soul by sitting in these hot springs with these minerals. And then down at the bottom, they they, they had some cold water. I'm talking polar bear club, cold. Just just, this hot day, it's been 90s lately. Oh, that cold water, that's so good. But there's a little point in the middle where they met. It was murky, lukewarm water. Jesus said, that's who you are. You think you're rich. You think you're, you're well off, but you don't realize that you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. You have no vision. Man, Jesus didn't hold back at these open houses. And I think about, think about these terminologies with me. As we look at these seven congregations in Asia, one was loveless. Continue on with me. One was loveless. The next one had some, some fear issues. The next one, well, they compromised a little bit. The one after that, well, they weren't exactly compromising, but they were tolerating certain things. The one after that, well, they, they were just dead. They, they weren't awake. They were asleep. Lulled into false security. One was good. Jesus said, just keep doing what you're doing. One was lukewarm. Out of seven congregations who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, only one was truly sound. Church, it's time for us to have our own examination. If Upland could be placed in one of the seven categories, which one would it be? Now, don't, I don't need shouts, especially if you woke up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. I'm not saying we are one of the six. But where are the odds? I think about not only where would we place Upland, but where would the community place the Upland Church of Christ? See, whenever May 19th rolls around and people come through these doors and they see us, they're not going to see anything different than what Jesus has already seen about us. How how do we be the one out of seven? How do we be the Philadelphia? How do we we be the individuals that, that we keep persevering? Even when we face trouble, we keep holding fast to our crown. We let our light shine in the neighborhood. We let everyone know who Jesus is. How is it that that we can be one of the seven? How do we how do we shift? If we're off course just a little bit, how do we get back on the straight path? Maybe, maybe not even the church, but maybe I as a member, maybe I've been feeling a little lukewarm. Maybe I have been lulled to sleep a little bit. Maybe I do things out of tradition rather than out of sincerity. How do I be a church that glorifies God? Let me tell you. 
I have to be bold. And I have to pray for boldness in Jesus Christ. The word boldness, it means confident. It means assurance. It means that I understand no matter where I am, I know where Jesus is. And I know that He is going to see me through. It means that even when I face difficulty in my life, I can trust in Him. Even though I face turmoil. Even though I face trouble. Even though I'm suffering from temptation. Even when I'm with loss. Even when I'm without. I'm like Paul who said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Who makes me bold. I want to take you to Acts chapter 4. And I want you to see with me what a church did to reach out to the community. Isn't that what we're trying to do? To change Upland for the better. How do we do that? I appreciate Lydell when he prayed this morning. He prayed that I would have boldness in the Word of God. I appreciate that because sometimes it's difficult to preach God's Word. It's even more difficult to live out God's Word. I think about Peter and John. Here's Peter and John. They just healed an individual. He had been suffering from this ailment for over 40 years, and they began preaching. Some people were annoyed. You read verse 2, they were greatly annoyed. So they arrested Peter and John, and they interrogated them. They threatened them, but then they released them. I want you to think, if you were arrested by law enforcement for preaching the name of Christ, and you're thrown into one of those rooms, and you're yelled at, and and for hours on end you're held there, and you're threatened by the law of the land? What would you do? What would be your reaction? See, I I love that their reaction, it wasn't one... It wasn't one that, that was angry with God. They didn't weep. They didn't curse God. They didn't run out of town. What they did was they found their brothers and sisters of the faith and they prayed. And I want you to hear how they prayed. You have your Bibles with you? Read with me in verses 25 through 28 or through 29. Begin in verse 24. They said, Sovereign Lord. Sovereign Lord. That means the ruler over everyone and everything. That means he's in absolute control. Would you feel that way if you'd just been persecuted? Could you say, you're my sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth said it themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His anointed. For truly in the city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had been destined to take place. Let's pause right there. What, what he's saying is, what they're praying is, God, we know you're in control. In fact, we don't understand why people try to do anything against you. There's this example of Jesus, you know, Herod was against him, Pilate was against him, the Roman Gentiles were against him, even the Jewish nation was against him, yet they all still became a part of God's plan to offer Jesus up as a sacrifice so that He could forgive us from our sins. So even though they plot against God, even though they fight against us, Even though they push us back, God, we know You are in control. And God, we know You will see us through. So I want you to hear what they prayed. And now, O Lord, look upon that threat. That means, God, just take note. And grant to Your servants not to suffer anymore. Is that what your translation says? And and hold back on our suffering. Make everything a okay. I have a more modern translation. No, that's not what they prayed. I want you to hear and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. They're saying, God, don't push against them. Encourage us. Build us up. Let us continue to be bold. See, the people who arrested these men, they were cowards. You know how I know that? Because although they threatened them, they intimidated them, they let them go, verse 21, finding no way to punish them. Because all the people were praising God. They weren't ready to stand up against the wave. They were cowards. And these men, you know what they prayed? God, make us bold. That was their situation. What's our situation? With this open house and with every event, do we ever pray about it? 
I don't mean just here. I mean at home. When you're there with your children, when you're there over, over the dinner table, when you're about to go to sleep, do you pray that the work of the Lord will continue? Do you pray that you'll have the confidence to reach out to somebody, even when it's outside your comfort zone? Even when it puts you at odds? Even when it puts you at risk? That's what being bold is all about. Pushing, going beyond, going against. See, when I think about what is a successful congregation, is it really the lights? Is it the building? Is it the, the programs? No. A success, well, the success follows a congregation when the congregation is willing to be bold enough to think beyond its own comfort and see the harvest in front of its own eyes. When we are willing to be bold enough to go beyond our ways and our comfort and to embrace God's calling, His mission, and His victory, that's when the Upland congregation finds success. And I want you to see the impact. I want you to notice the impact of this prayer. God did make them bold. God can help them continue in verse 31 to speak the word with boldness. And then we see the consequence of speaking the word with boldness. They're all united. One heart and one soul. No one ever really needed anything because they had all things in common. I mean, they didn't cling on to certain things that they thought was important. They were like Jesus in Philippians 2, verse 6. Well, although He was God, He did not consider it something to hold on to. He did not consider it something to grasp. Instead, if anyone had anything in need, they gave of their means. They were bold enough to give of their own possessions to those who were without. And because, you notice with me, in verse 33, because they lived out the message, they were better able to preach the message. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I just wanted this morning for us to pause and reflect. Because in the end, the success of our open house on May 19th, it's not about the number of visitors. If we had one one person attend in all of the four hours that we have. That's not a failure. So long as they hear the message of God, so long as we teach them the truth. And brothers and sisters, if they become a child of God by that open house, that open house is worth every penny, every hour of labor, every hour of discomfort. Because we were able to preach boldly and with confidence the name of our Lord Jesus and reach out to that one soul. But we have to take the first step. Am I praying on a daily basis to be confident for the kingdom? No matter where I go, whether it's with the open house, the postal drive, the breakfast, VBS, whatever it is, Am I being an eyewitness to Jesus? Am I willing to teach the great news that has delivered me from sin and death? Am I willing to impart that on someone who needs Jesus just as much as I do? If you're not a child of God and you do not understand the love of Christ, God has opened the doorway for you today. You just have to be bold. You have to be willing to go beyond the comfort and embrace Jesus, believing in who He is, turning from the things that you used to desire that caused you to sin, confessing He is Lord, being baptized into Christ. And if you're a child of God and you've been struggling with boldness in this community, boldness with your friends, maybe you just have a sin on your heart, maybe you have temptation on your mind, maybe there's just a burden on your soul, and you need prayers, this is the time to do it. Be bold for Christ. If you need anything at all, come now while we stand and while we sing.